Okay, let's get started this time. Welcome everybody to this session about caching, uh, caching in application still matters. So today uh, we are two speakers for this session, Henri and I. I'm going to start introducing myself. I am Anthony Dahani and I am a software engineer working for Software AG. It's a German company and we got several enterprise products. Among them, we have uh, Terracotta products such as open source EH Cache 3, EH Cache 2 as well, Terracotta Server, and soon to be Terracotta Store. I am most, I'm spending most of my time working on the management and monitoring aspects of the Terracotta products. And also, I have a special interest with uh, cloud deployments, uh, Docker, Kubernetes, and these kind of things to make sure our products, open source and EE, deploy, uh, deploy correctly into the cloud. When I'm not working for Software AG, uh, sometimes I still have time to, um, to co-manage uh, the Java user group uh, in Montreal. I'm a co-leader uh, of, uh, of uh, this uh, user group, as well as um, I'm also uh, part of, uh, of the people managing the DevOps for Kids uh, Quebec uh, initiative. What about you, Henri? Hi. <laughs> um, so um, I, I'm Henri Tremblay. I'm also a software engineer at Terracotta. I'm working mostly on the each e cache side of it. I'm also a leader of the uh, EasyMock open source framework and AppGenesis, which is the thing that creates mock object for every other framework in general. Um, um, as well, a Montreal Jug leader by some randomness, and uh, Java champion, Oracle Groundbreaker Ambassador, which is why the demo you'll see today will be on the Oracle Cloud, because I need to tell you that it's working well. And that, that's pretty much it. The presentation today will talk about caching in application mainly, with different layer and different implementation you might use. Uh, Everything is, so of course we'll use EHCache to showcase that and a Terracotta server, but uh, everything applies to any kind of framework you would like to use. Yes, let's get started from there. Uh, I lost the end of my sentence, but it doesn't matter. So, what is caching? Um, in general, you should know about it, but uh, we'll give some formal explanation. Uh, to help people realizing how important that is, because it tends to be forgotten frequently in application and uh, in general, actually. So I do think it's, and if the clicker wants to do what I want it to do, no, it doesn't, it doesn't. You might see the other slide at some point. Cool. Um, so a cache is a basic thing, it's a store of things that you, you're planning to want to retrieve really quickly and that you know you'll use really frequently in general. The best example I've found of that is my pocket here. So for instance, this is my hotel key. It's really quickly available from my pocket, which is a cache for my backpack. My backpack is way bigger than my pocket, but things I really want to use quickly are cached in my pocket. So that's the best way to see it. It's smaller, but it's way slower to retrieve something from there. It's like five seconds compared to a minute, depending how good I've stored my stuff in the, in the backpack. Okay, uh, for what we will talk about, please clicker, thank you. Uh, in our, so in our case, we, uh, a cache is generally a map, so ca some kind of hash map key value store, so we put stuff we want to retrieve really quickly there. Uh, there's two important things that we add to make it a cache. One is capacity control, so when the cache reach a given size, we start evicting stuff to keep that size to prevent out of memory, because if the cache was infinite, it will be your backend, actually. The other thing is freshness. So cache data, cache data tend to get old at some point, so we want to expire them to go back to the back end to get the fresh value. So that's more or less the way it goes. Uh, we do have caching all over the place. A good example is, of course, CPU. So in a CPU, you have different layers of cache. Modern CPUs have three layers of cache those days. And with these different latencies, depending on what kind of cache you hit. The only important thing here to realize is that 
you, when you use a cache, you expect to have an order of magnitude faster access to things. It should not be like 1.5% faster because putting stuff in the cache is costly, maintaining the cache is costly. You're expecting something way faster. Otherwise, your caching is totally useless. So that's, and that's what happens with L1, L2 on the CPU. As you can notice, L1 is like 14 times faster than L2. L2 is about, I don't know, 15 times faster than, uh, than main memory. So it's that kind of thing. So th never forget that when you will do your caching performance tuning. Then, uh, where is cache used? Pretty much all over the place. Of course, a browser is one of the most important source of cache these days. But you have uh, underneath, you will use normally a CDN, if you, especially if you're worldwide, because you will like your static resource to be geolocated, for instance. So you, you'll use a CDN for that. I, we, I won't go in details on any of the, those because we want to talk about application caching. CPU caching, we just talked about it. You even have disk caching. So when reading on a hard disk, there's a layer of cache that keeps the data that was frequently used on, the, uh, on your disk. And of course, application caching, which is the purpose of the day. Uh, how do you know if you need to cache something? Uh, you use MDAL's law, which is frequently used for pretty much any performance tuning task. So you check, the, so the concept is there that you want to optimize what takes the most time, which is pretty obvious. So in this case, you have A and B, so two parts of the, your task. If you optimize B, you get something that it's a tiny bit faster. If you optimize A, you get something that is like three times faster. So of course, it's A you would like to optimize. Then you have two ways to do that, to optimize it, like reading the code, profiling it, and make it faster. But frequently, the easiest solution, especially if you're calling some random web service that is super slow, we'll see that in the demo, there's no way to be faster. Uh, so caching is the solution. So caching does hide slow performances, but it does it perfectly. So if you have the memory to do it, just do it. It's, it takes five minutes, and you're done. So then and use them down law to pick what you really want to cache. Um, then there's a concept called the long tail, which is that when you have a bunch of data, it's really rare that you will evenly use every, uh, every entries. You will, in generally, some entries will be used a bit more than others. Uh, here, it's an ice cream flavor. So do, do you think that people will order this evenly every kind of flavor of ice cream? No, of course not. Vanilla is way more demanded than uh, everything else, actually, than chocolate, than raspberry. And so if you don't have place in your freezer at your front desk to, to put some ice cream, you, you'll take mint that nobody wants, and that's what you will put in your back store in the freezer. So that's, that's, that's in general the same for caching. It will, call to, it will try to keep hot data in there, and it will evict whatever is not used to make things efficient. OK, then, to make sure everything works as according to plan, um, you need to check how your cache is behaving. There's some glossary about it. So a cache hit is when you ask the cache about something, and it's there, which is the good thing. A cache miss is when you ask the cache about something, and it's not there, obviously. Uh, we'll call it a hit rate, uh, hit ratio, sorry, the, uh, the difference between these two things. And the other concept is cold and hot. So when you start a server, in general, you get a cold cache, so it's empty. So cold means empty. And hot cache is a cache filled with things, so you're happy. Uh, there's different things to do that. One is to use a distributed caching. The other will be to prefetch stuff when you start a server, for instance. Because, of course, a cold cache means being a bit slower at the beginning. So what to measure? You want to see if, it's em if your cache is empty, if it's totally full. You want to see if things get evicted from your cache a lot or not, because that's not a good sign. Of course, you want to see the current size if it's used. Um, the hit ratio is super important, because that's how efficient your cache is. So for some data, it might not be useful to cache them, because they change all the time, and you have a really bad hit ratio. 
and iterate is how much your cache is used in time. And I have a little example here. Uh, let's go there. And I'll just start this application, let it start. And we'll use uh, here, it's a JSR 107 matrix exposed in the, and I, I use Visual VM to, to showcase them. So it's here, it's probably way too small for you to see anything, so I will, I will make it a bit bigger, just a second, here we go. Is that all right? It's enough? Cool. So here we have different, ca ooh, but I, then I don't see my numbers, let's just, ah. Uh, stupid thing. Uh, just let me get my numbers. Thank you, numbers, and we'll go back to big again. So, and it's super, 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 super important because this will seem really silly, but I did a lot of pen tuning at different companies and they tend to screw it up. So first, have matrix for your cache. Two, have a look at them to see if they're meaningful. So this is a good example. So we can see that this cache has no hits and it's always missing. So it needs to be looked at, obviously. It means that the cache is totally useless. So this is just overhead. So you're actually slower by using a cache. So of course, you need to investigate there. Um, this one, it seems to work. So we have a bunch of cache hits here. However, it's evicting like crazy. So it probably means the cache is too small or the data are changing too much. There, so there, there's probably something wrong in there as well. So having a look will be a good idea. Um, this is it's kind of OK, but the, the rate is not that good. So maybe you should use your memory somewhere else to get a better hit rate, because it doesn't seem to be a, that useful cache. Or you need to change your caching strategy to get hotter data in there. So this is not that bad, but should be investigated. Uh, this is a really frequent one. It means that your, um, your cache is not really that used. You, you're caching something and you use it once, and then, I don't know, it, it was, it's stuck somewhere in some other cache and it's never called again, so you're just wasting memory for no reason. Uh, this is a, a one that is just not working. So no hit, no miss, no nothing. There's stuff in there, but nobody's requesting for it. That's quite frequent as well. So, and it's, you just read that from the numbers. And this is perfect. I have 90% hit rate, so it's a well-used cache. Uh, there's a correct hit ratio there. I, I have no, not so much eviction here, zero. So this one is, is nice. So this one I, I want to keep, it, it's working efficiently. Okay, back to the presentation. Ah, then I need to. Yup, yup, yup. I'll go back to correct size. And that's for you, Anthony. Yes, thank you, Henri. And before moving on to caching on the JVM, I would like to show you something that is pretty interesting and not that well known, actually. So let's go through a real example, and this example shouldn't be that far. It's about JVM caching. So I got a little quiz for you today. Is You see this code? So here, basically, I'm trying to compare um, integer value of 100 to integer value of 100. The question is, equals equals is going to work on the instance, on the reference. And normally, integer value of should create a new instance every time you call it, right? So would you think that, that it would be the same instance or not the same? Who votes for the same? Same, same, all right. And who thinks it's not the same? Oh, yeah, a few hands, but most people, uh, seem, most people seem to think that it was, go it was going to be the same. So let's have a look and let's run it. It's the same instance. All right, congratulations. Now, if I move this number to, say, 1,024, 1,024 should still be the same, right? No, all right, you know it. All right. <laughs> so yeah, you're right. It's not the same. Why? It's because 
there have been uh, some values, some integers have been cached by the JVM. Whenever you're starting the JVM, by default, it's going to cache a range of integers so that it won't have to create new instances uh, for common uh, numbers. And we have also a little, um, a little piece of code that is going to help you see that. And here, if I'm running this, so I'm basically running exactly the same thing between one, uh, minus 140 and plus 150. And let's have a look. And you see some of them were cached, some of them were not. And if you see the range, that started at one, um, minus 128 up until uh, the same, I guess, yeah, 127. Well, actually, to be honest, if, if I had just looked at the code, I would have seen that there is something named integer cache as part of the JVM. And that is this thing that will eagerly uh, fill this cache um, when you start up the JVM. OK, cool. Um, so the, J, uh, the JVM also has some caching by itself. But what is in, what's in interesting is what about the, well, do you have any uh, caching library available for your application, right? So when you write some applications, do you, if you want to apply what Henri said, do you have some libraries to help you out? Well, actually, there's a JSL for that, a Java specific, um, uh, uh, um, Java specific application request. Oh, yes. Wow, <laughs> damn. <laughs> 107, it's his name, and it was actually started out in 2001, but for a long time, nothing happened. Meanwhile, in 2003, EHCache, the library was created, and its initial goal was uh, focused on Hibernate, you know, the famous ORM, and it was used as a second level cache uh, for Hibernate. At the same time, um, Terracotta, the Terracotta server was created, and the Terracotta server at that time was about clustering JVMs. Um, then it happened so that Terracotta, the company, acquired EHCache. So soon after, uh, the next release of EHCache would use the Terracotta cluster as a clustered tier, meaning that not only the value would be cached on heap, inside your JVM, but for, if, for example, your, um, your on heap memory was full, so if your cache was full, then it would start putting some, uh, some additional values to the cluster tier to actually the Terracotta server. Soon after, there, is, uh, there was also a good improvement with EH cache, the library. Uh, it was the addition of off heap tier. So I, I said on heap, off heap, on heap is basically uh, subject to the, garbage, uh, to the garbage collector. So whenever you start having a lot of data on heap, then the garbage collector will probably, you know, try to uh, try to free up some memory. And doing so, when you have large on heap sizes, then it can take a while, and it really affects uh, re reliability in terms of performance, right? So the cool thing with off heap is that you're storing your data not inside the JVM but outside the JVM, so it's still on memory but outside the JVM. And at yeah. least outside heap, what? it's still in the JVM memory, but it's outside heap. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. <laughs> so it's not subject to the uh, to the GC anymore. It's the we were doing our internal GC management actually, which is, it's pretty easy with a cache because you kind of know that you only have key values with a cache, so it's much easier to do. Uh, but there is a price to pay with yeah, heap. Obviously. It's serialization. Since you're getting out uh, of on heap, you need to serialize and deserialize. So you're paying this price, but the cool thing, well, still the main advantage of, of heap storing for caching is that it's reliable. Whether you've, uh, you've got just few entries or you've got gigabytes or even terabytes of data, you will have basically the same performance, whatever happens. But, it's, but could not be said of on heap. Well, even if there was some progress uh, with uh, garbage collector in the recent yeah, years. It's something that changed a little bit because we used to say that under over four gigabyte and maybe eight GC was nice with you, so you will be fine uh, when using a CMS, for instance. Now things are, are getting blurrier because you have G1, which is supposed to support a lot of data. You have ZGC that is coming in Java 11. Um, and of course, you already have C4 with Azul, things like that. So these are able to withstand a really high heap. So it might remove the need to go off heap, or you, it might allow you to have a much bigger on heap cache than what you used to have before. However, we still think that off heap is, is necessary because 
because you're not in Java 11 yet in general. And <laughs> the other, the other reason is that they, 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 it's still um, these new GC are good, but they're not totally, totally super tuned yet and ready for action. So wait a little bit. And meanwhile, you have your layers, so your on heap layer, your off heap layer, and your cluster layer to get performance. True. Back to JSA 107, the spec, hey, 12 years later, public review happens. And soon after <laughs> that, public release. So Java has a spec, as an official spec for uh, caching. And thanks to that, well, of course, uh, EHCache, we decided to uh, you know, um, leverage this uh, specification for the latest version. And also, our competitors have done the same. So whenever you want to move from EHCache to one of the competing, uh, don't, competing don't want libraries, yeah, you we wouldn't love, want to. We all that. love EH cache, obviously. <laughs> True. But yeah, that wouldn't be that hard in terms of API because, you know, we just uh, embrace this API. Uh, soon after, uh, JSA 107 last year be, uh, came out with uh, 1.1, so it was a small update. We also got it, and EH cache. So EH cache reboot, EH cache free, out uh, in 2016, two years already, compatible with JSA 107. Strong typing uh, for whatever you put in your cache, uh, so very uh, nice API to use. During the same year, we of course re-implemented the cluster tier, so that you know you can have um, you can use the Terracotta cluster to handle uh, this last tier. High availability was added to the Terracotta server this same year as well. What did we do in 2018? So we are embracing Java 8, dropping uh, Java 6 support. We have also documented resilient strategies such as what happens when your cache is not working. Should it crash your application or should it just you know, display some warnings? So uh, we have this kind of thing to, uh, to review. And uh, also, uh, we made some uh, performance improvement recently last month with the latest version 3.6 available on Maven Central. Um, what about the integration of EH Cache 3? Do you need to use EH Cache 3 directly? and JSA 107 directly, or does your fa favorite uh, framework library already using it? JSA 107, Spring, Juice, Jcache, CDI, Hibernate, Jhipster, Boutique, they already embrace JSA 107, so just drop EH cache free on your class path, some configuration, you're ready to go. For, for Spring is actually the default, so if you, it, as soon as Spring notices that JSR 107 is available, so the jar is there, it will try to load your, the, the cache from there and it will just magically configure. So normally you won't do that in the end, but if you want something that works out of the box without any tuning, it will just work. Right. Some of our libraries decided to directly rely on EH Cache 3. Uh, so thank you for your trust. But, um, yeah, that means that basically we cannot easily replace uh, in that case. Um, what about the caching patterns? Uh, that's pretty interesting. Um, the first one, no caching. So that seems dumb uh, at first, but it's super important. And we're saying this because we've seen many people using, you know, uh, putting a caching library in their application and then starting doing in their test some assertions on the content of their cache. So they basically say, oh, I put this key value. So I expect to retrieve this key value just after it, right? The thing is, is that if you remember what Henri said early, um, earlier, there is expiration control and eviction control. So whatever is in your cache, you never really know. I mean, you cannot make any assertions on the content of your cache. It's a living thing, right? It's not a map. You can really decide to throw away some values. So make sure whenever you start testing your application that when you unplug caching, it still works. Maybe the performance won't be the same, right? Because, well, no caching, sometimes you will need to pay the price of computation or whatever. But at least that should still, you know, functionally work. So keep that in mind when you do testing. Try to sometimes to unplug caching and see if it still works. Cache aside is the most common pattern for caching. And here is how it works. You've got your code, your uh, business service, and the first thing that it's going to do is, OK, I want to retrieve uh, the value uh, associated with this key, right? So get uh, on this key k. It's asking the cache. And then the cache, unfortunately, at first says, no, sorry, I don't have it. So it returns nil. Then 
your business logic should then ask the system of records. So that could be a database, a web service, or a long computation. And it's going to say, well, please give me this value, but uh, that's probably going to take longer. Once you get this value, that's great, you get it, so you can use it. But before using it, just make sure that you put it in cache so that the subsequent calls will hit the cache directly and you won't pay the price of going back to the system of record for this key value. Okay. There's unfortunately a small issue with cache aside that could happen when you have multiple concurrent access to the same key value. Imagine that you've got 10 threads that actually want the same value associated to the key K. And if they come exactly at the same moment, when they're going to ask the cache for the first time, the cache is going to say, oh, sorry, well, it's no. So what those 10 threads are going to do is that they, immediately, they will immediately ask the system of record, right? And they could actually well, pound very hard on the system of record because they're going to be 10 at a time attacking your system of record. And basically, you implemented cache. I mean, you added a cache in your application to avoid this kind of scenario. So that kind of sucks, right? So beware of this, um, this use case. And one way to implement that, you could do that in your code, is that you could you know, refrain uh, all the threads to start um, uh, to try to get exactly the same key at the same moment. But I would like to expose this, um, this issue in a quick demo. Uh, we have this. Um, um, OK, here in this code. So in this, little co in this little piece of code, and by the way, all the examples are on GitHub. So there is a link uh, to uh, it. Yeah, you cache three samples. But yeah, there's a link. So here we're going to init cache aside. So basically, we configure the cache uh, well, with uh, on heap, for example. And then we will have 10 threads attacking um, that will actually try to get the, the same value. So in typical cache aside fashion, uh, you retrieve a cache, and then you ask uh, cache, please give me that key. If it's no, then I go to the system of record. But the thing is, is that I'm going to start 10 threads on the exact same key. So basically, um, well, they, they will all hit uh, the system of record. Uh, no. So if I start this application, as you could see, they have all been trying to, so this, log, uh, so this log message is coming from the system of record. It's basically saying, oh, someone has tried to access me, right? Someone has tried to access the system of record. As, as you could see, there are, well, there are a lot of uh, threads, a uh, lot of occurrences, and then we've got some errors. And this error is about no collection available. Because in this case, in this example, I have a system of record that is, well, you know, an artificial system of record, but still, I also have pooling, and I only have five, um, for in, in my connection pool, I only authorize five threads to come. So what happened in this case, it's even worse, right? Because the 10 are coming exactly at the same time, going to hit my system of record, but there's only room for five. So the five overs will never get the value. But so they fail, they, they throw exception, and uh, they, yeah. they just burn. Yeah, but just going to fail to access the system of record, only five of them will actually retrieve the value. So uh, beware of the thundering hurt because it could hurt your database and it could also even return bad values. I mean, that could really break the, um, uh, the functional behavior of your application. So um, one way to prevent that, uh, as I just said, you could try to synchronize your clients, but there's also another caching pattern that is named cache through. Cache through is a bit different because your business logic will never ever talk to the system of record. It will directly talk to the cache, right? It's going to ask the cache, do you have this value? And if the cache doesn't have it, it's going to ask the system of record itself. How does the cache know how to access your system of record? This is where you need to implement a cache loader writer uh, interface. When, one you, sorry, when you implement this interface, you basically instruct your cache how to access the system of record. So if it's a database, probably it's going to use JDBC. If it's a web service, you'll probably tell it how to do that. And then once, uh, when the cache retrieves the, the value, it will be able to put it in cache and return the value. So next time, of course, uh, the business logic, uh, the cache will be able to give the value directly. So the cool thing with that is that if you've got 10 threads attacking the cache at the same time, well, this time they won't all go 
to the system of record, right? The cache will handle um, will handle the access and will just let one go through. So let's go with this uh, small example. And if this time I try to uh, use cache through, we will see that the system of record will be accessed just once, and all the nine over access, they are just waiting for the value to be retrieved, and when it's going to be retrieved, the cache it will just give it. So this is what they, this is what the, all the threads say, is that they're all happy. They didn't starve the connection pool, they didn't attack the system of record. They, I mean, your cache was really like protecting your system of record. So this is a very interesting uh, caching pattern as well. But it's just, you know, it takes a little bit more energy, right, because you need to implement yet another interface. So yeah, that's kind of a downside. Yeah, and uh, there's three things important. So we're going in layer of complexity here. So of course, cache aside is simpler than cache true because true because cache true you need to think about transaction management ab about different things. So uh, you go there if you need to. It will protect you for from thundering and herd, but with eh cache. So we have no idea for other frameworks. We we will synchronize on the key which is why it's, the, it's hard to do it with cache aside, because, because cache aside, you might push a synchronize over the entire cache, but then you stock the full cache. In this case, we, we will block on a concurrent HMAX segment, actually, so you, you get a limited amount of keys that will be blocked by the, the synchronization, which brought, uh, brings much more performance. Uh, I don't know, as I said, I don't know about other frameworks, so don't rely on that with other frameworks without testing, but for EHCache, it does work perfectly. Um, that's it. Yep. I had a third thing that I forgot, but that's a good start. <laughs> Before moving on to clustered caching, um, I would like to introduce you to our little uh, demo app. So it's uh, actually a web app based on Spring Boot, and uh, it also relies on, uh, on a database. So I think it's already started. That should be already started. Yep. So let's have a look at this, uh, at this application. Those of you who were to my other talks may have uh, seen it already. This um, is also in the samples. So if you want to look how to true. use a caching and EH cache in a real application, like Spring Boot normal things, you get all the wiring there. So this application is, is a bit weird because it's about, it's like listing um, a portion of the internet movie database. So we are listing some actors. And for each actor, when you click when you click on uh, on their name, so on on their entry, the application will retrieve a weather report for the day, for the birth date of this actor, right? So here, for example, it was in 1790, uh, 1975. So we're going to retrieve a weather report for this date in several cities. So as you may expect, we will going to um, well, first load the entry, for, well, the actor entry from the database. But uh, the most importantly, we will call several uh, REST APIs, so um, for example, a geolocation, as well as a weather report for different cities. These are real response time, it's that slow. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And here in this case, uh, it took more than five seconds. So right now, I don't have caching. So what's, what's happening when I refresh this page for this given actor? Well, unfortunately, it will go back and try to uh, try to re-eat the, the web services if I'm happy, uh, if I'm if I'm lucky, it's going to be a bit, um, a bit faster. But usually, you will still uh, spend a few seconds on it. And in the case of um, of distant uh, APIs, you may even pay the price. Actually, you know, maybe you are billed by each call. So caching is would be really appropriate in this use case. So let's go to the code base and let's have a look here. Oh, well, fortunately enough, I already have the uh, the annotation ready for me. So here I am putting this annotation. I'm rebuilding my application. And by default, it's going to use uh, local caching in this configuration. So normally, now I'm going to reload it once more. Now I have caching enabled. So what the cache is going to do is that it's going to put the result um, into it. So that was pretty long. But now next time I reload this page, normally it will directly read uh, from the cache. So this is what happened much faster this time. Um, one nice thing to uh, to look at is metrics. 
Henri, I've shown you, I've shown to you uh, the JMX, um, the JMX uh, interface for JSR 107, and in this application, we have a web UI on top of this. So I'm going basically to see exactly the same uh, metrics that Henri was showing with Visual VM. So here, for example, we had um, uh, for the weather reports. So there is five weather report per actor. And we did 10 gets because I refreshed the, pi the page twice. The first time, the five gets uh, were actually uh, were not found. They were, not, um, they were misses. So I should have five misses. Then five puts, of course. And then the time after, when I re-ask uh, re exactly the same weather reports, I should have hits, right? So basically, for now, my hit ratio is 50%. OK, so far, so good. Uh, I guess uh, that sounds pretty OK. One. Uh, one P4. I mean, one thing that you need to carefully uh, watch when you when you start uh, configuring caching in your application is uh, the size, the size of your cache. So let's have a look here at my configuration. My configuration is using a default value for cache size. I think by memory it's 100 elements. So for my example, with five with five entries, uh, five is less than 100. So that's pretty cool. What if I put one. And you know, that really, once again, that seems dumb, but some people sometimes, I mean, in over, we, uh, I mean, at over scale, uh, of course, they would do this kind of mistake, right? They would actually put uh, a very small size for, uh, for their caching. So what happens in this case is that this time, your application will work to, to, to put the entries inside the cache and as well as it's going to work to get it from the cache, but the cache will be useless, right? It's, it's going to be another layer, uh, it's going to be a useless layer that actually is gonna consume, um, that's going to consume resources for nothing. So if I go back to this uh, actor view, okay, uh, well, let's pick another one actually. <coughs> so if I go to this one, to this actor, whenever I'm going to load the page, so you know I just have one, I mean I just have one entry that can be put in cache. So since this page is trying to do five puts, it's going to do one put, and then after the second put, it will need to evict the cache because there's no more room, so it's going to evict, and then it's going to do the, the put, and then for the next call it's going to evict and do the put, and so on and so forth. And eviction as a cost, so that's really going to kill the performance of your application and there's no caching uh, at all. I mean, caching is totally useless in this case. Actually, you're, you're basically shooting yourself in, in the foot. So maybe you would, uh, you would see that um, once again through metrics. If you go to the metrics, then you will see that you've got 100% cache miss. That's your enemy. If you do this, then your cache is not being uh, properly configured, and it's really um, an impediment to, uh, to your application performance. So be careful with that. Clustering. Sure. Five minutes. But before clustering, ah. there's something that I wanted to say is that those metrics, so here we have, uh, you know, we have a web UI integration. You also, uh, you, you have also demoed with, uh, with VMBin directly yeah. using Visual VM. You got uh, TMC, but that's enterprise. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> we, yeah, we have an enterprise offering, but we have also something that can be used by everybody. So if you're uh, familiar with Prometheus, oh yeah. Uh, if you're uh, familiar with uh, Prometheus framework, then you would also be able to um, to share your um, caching metrics with Prometheus. So here, all your Jcache statistics are available uh, via Prometheus servlet. This is definitely possible that you can export those metrics to some external monitoring application. So you know you would be able to monitor your hardware, your, uh, well, your infra, as well as uh, your caching, because this is really important. True, Henri, uh, clustered caching. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get to it. And you can do that with a Terracotta server. Once again, it's open source. Feel free to, to go there. So how does that work? Well, the idea is that when you start scaling in the cloud, for example. So when you start having replicas of the same application, and all those applications, they are basically configure, uh, they, they, they basically configure the exact same cache. But the problem is that each application will have its own local cache, right? So if you don't do clustering, they, they will 
each try to put the same, probably the same key value uh, mappings, right? Unless. Yeah. And also, they might be desynchronized. So if you put two different things in two different places, they, you won't True. get the same one. So. Yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. Because you know, eviction, expiration, control could not be exactly the same for each application. So one way to synchronize their cache view is to use the Terracotta server. So that's going to be your point of synchronization between all your replicas so that they will all share the same cache status. It can also be uh, high, av uh, made high available with a, with a mechanism of active and passive. Um, so here, the architecture of our application is slightly uh, uh, changing. So we have a MySQL database, no longer an H2 in-memory database. And this time, our application will connect to uh, the Terracotta server uh, clustered caching. So the way it works is that it's a layered, uh, once again, it's a layered cache. So if uh, the key value is in, on heap, well, that's great. If it's not on heap, it will try to get it from uh, the clustered layer. Um, so we have actually an example of, uh, of this deployment. I have deployed this with um, Kubernetes, actually. So Kubernetes on the Oracle Cloud. <laughs> <laughs> OK. <laughs> yes, indeed. And um, the same thing. So the application is working kind of the same. Uh, so if I go, for example, for this actor, Jeremy London, so once again, the first time I go there, I pay the price uh, to do all the puts, well, to get all the, the results from the web services and then uh, put uh, everything inside the cache. So that took a long time. Well, 11 seconds, that was super slow. <laughs> if I refresh, normally it's in cache, it's the local cache, nothing has changed, right? So now pay attention to this little banner, right? This is the host name of the container that has been serving this request. What I'm going to do now is that I'm going to um, I'm going to st scale my application, and by scaling, I will add more replicas for my web application. So I would f probably do something like Kubernetes, uh, Kubectl, scale, deployment, uh, full stack is the name of uh, the application, and then replicas equals three, for example. So when I do this, my uh, orchestration tool is telling me, well, that's good to, uh, that's good to go, and as you can see, uh, it will start trying to run other instances. So the first one that I got was this one, and now the two others are, you know, being are starting being deployed. So this is uh, standard uh, orchestration tool uh, stuff. Now the interesting thing is that those three replicas are using clustered caching. So normally, they will all see, uh, they will all get from cache uh, this actor that I've already loaded, right? It means that the new, the new instances will be started with the hot cache instance. Exactly. Faster, and then you get, you yep. get the, the values from the other one. And then you get the same effect if you get failover. So if one server crashes and other goes up, they will benefit of the clustered cache, which is, of course, not as fast as if you were on heap, if it was kept on heap. But it's much better than the terrible web service we're running. Exactly. So the first instance was 62 <coughs> RTX. And it got it, well, it put it inside its cache. And now if I refresh, probably uh, Kubernetes will uh, uh, follow through my request via another host, this time N42HB. As, as you can see, it didn't try to fetch all the resources. But it, you know, if you remember, the, the value is, was less than 10 milliseconds because just like Henri said, it, it, it used to come from heap. But now this time it had to go to a Terracotta cluster to uh, recover this value. But 62 milliseconds is much better than 11 seconds we have. Exactly, before. yeah, exactly, let's, yeah. Let's yeah. say we have a gain here. Yeah, sure, you always need to, to compare. Are we? We need to finish? Yeah, we need to finish. Uh, let's go with the slides. Here we go. So that was the, the, the best thing, like the most complicated thing, but the most efficient way you can do caching, clustered caching with different layers. Uh, and the most, so it's the most evolved possibility. So from there, uh, it's all we had. Um, if so if you want an old version of this conference uh, slides, they're there. We'll probably put this one on SlideShare as well to get something up to date. Um, there's another one about using caching, which is caching 101, and you can have a look for EHCache. This is, of course, the documentation, ehcache.org. EHCache and Terracotta servers demos are on EHCache samples. We try to maintain them uh, along the way, so they should be all the time up to date. Everything we've presented today is there. 
and some other stuff. Uh, I like to ask that at each presentation to know if it was worthful. Uh, by the way, man, who learned something? Please. Not bad. Cool. 70, 75. Good. That's good. Uh, otherwise, we'll take any questions. Since we're out of time, just come and ask. Uh, these are all the, w the places you can find us if needed. And that's all. Thank you very much for coming. <clears throat>